We're looking at how changes in college football are reaching the NFL, and we'll delve into the rise of pickleball. Plus, we'll get you ready for the U.S. Open. It's Monday, August 26th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, we are looking at how changes both in how college football is played and how players are empowered is having effects on the NFL with ESPN's Matt Miller. We'll also hear about the rise of pickleball and what's next for the sport as it seeks to reach the next level from Connor Pardo, who placed an early bet on the sport by founding the PPA Tour. We'll also check in on the US Open and some nuggets from Deion Sanders' recent press conference. First, here are your top headlines. Babe Ruth made history over the weekend, 76 years after his passing, with a record-setting piece of memorabilia. Ruth's called shot game jersey sold for a record $24.12 million at what some call the most anticipated sports auction ever. The sale nearly doubles the previous record for the most expensive piece of sports memorabilia, a 1952 Mickey Mantle card that went for $12.6 million. The Washington Commanders announced their intentions to build a statue to honor Sean Taylor, replacing the memorial that received major criticism from fans after it was unveiled two years ago. Taylor was murdered in November 2007 as an active player for the Washington franchise. His daughter Jackie will be involved in the construction of the new statue. Diamond Sports has reached an agreement to broadcast games for 13 NBA and 9 NHL teams next season, even as the company works through a bankruptcy declaration from March of 2023. The New Orleans Pelicans and Dallas Mavericks declined to continue their partnerships as they look toward digital alternatives. In its statement, Diamond noted that this new agreement is subject to approval by the bankruptcy court, which could prove to be an important detail. The Minnesota Lynx retired the number 23 jersey of Maya Moore on Saturday night in front of a record crowd of 19,023 people. After delivering four championships to the Lynx and becoming the first woman to sign a Jordan brand partnership, the legendary forward stepped away from basketball in 2019 to focus on criminal justice reform with her husband, Jonathan Irons. She officially retired in 2023. On her decision to step away, Moore said, the journey that I had was not expected, but it was exactly the journey that I was supposed to go on. Front Office Sports tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy reports that ESPN is set to make some substantial changes behind the scenes, including naming a replacement for executive Norby Williamson, who departed in April after clashing with programming president Burke Magnus and Pat McAfee. Mike also reports that the company is expected to eliminate at least five positions while promoting several executives and creating new positions with new responsibilities. The first college football games are in the books, and the NFL is on the horizon. I spoke to ESPN's Matt Miller on how changes in the college game could affect the NFL, the era of the starting rookie quarterback, why Deion Sanders may be serious about controlling where Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter end up, and plenty more. That conversation is next. I'm joined now once again by ESPN NFL Draft Analyst Matt Miller. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, thanks. I'm always a good time to sit down and talk about football and the business of football and everything else we have going on. Yeah, I know. We had a little hiatus from having you on, but it's great to have you back, you know, as we had a hiatus from football in the world. Um, So I'm going to start you with kind of a big, broad question. Uh, You know, we're in this era where, you know, college players want a lot of money. And we also see even as they get into the NFL, we have things like uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. is in a dispute with fanatics around a deal that he may or may not have with them. Caleb Williams uh, reportedly asked for equity in the Chicago Bears as he was, you know, joining the team for the first time. Do you think the sort of business interest that players have these days or coming in with these days, is that going to start affecting how teams relate to them and even things like where they get drafted? I don't think so, generally speaking. Now, what's interesting is, you know, like with the Caleb Williams rumors of him asking for equity, that's not allowed by the NFL. So even if the Bears wanted it, even if Caleb wanted it, it's not allowed. And when I was doing some reporting on that before the draft, what I was told was, if you asked Caleb Williams if he wanted equity in the Chicago Bears, he would probably look at you like, what the hell are you talking about? But it's more so the people around Caleb Williams uh, who would say, he is one of the greatest quarterback prospects of all time. We have leverage. Let's ask for the moon, basically, and see what we can get. Uh, I think Marvin Harrison Jr., you and I had talked about on a previous episode, he had leverage, so he had a very unique NFL draft process. He didn't participate in the NFL scouting combine. He didn't participate in the Ohio State Pro Day. He still went fourth overall. So I think that was kind of a almost like a test run to see how teams would value these players. We're going to get a fascinating test run with Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter, the two players from the University of Colorado, who Dion is the father of one and really like the godfather of another, or he's very involved in their draft processes. So 
we'll see how it plays out. I think, you know, as I've said before, there are a lot of positives to this. You know, student athletes are no longer forced to make it a business decision on it. It would be better for me to stay in college and improve my play. But financially, I need to go to the NFL and get get money, generational money in some of these cases. Now we're seeing young men who can say it's better for my NFL career to stay in college for another year. I can make good money, especially if you're a quarterback uh, through NIL and not have to make a, a quote unquote business decision out off the pressure of financials. So there's a lot of positives to it, but it is, it's changing the game. You know, this week we saw uh, the university of Alabama hire a general manager and his job will be recruiting, but it, a lot of it's going to be figuring out NIL. And it, I, I don't think it's long before we see almost like a salary cap when it comes to NIL, because there are, Everyone I've talked to, whether it be an agent or a college coach or, or you know, who college recruiting people say regulations coming. It, it's just a matter of time. And so I think we're seeing smart universities start to set that process up so that they're not caught flat footed like they were when when the rules changed regarding NIL. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the house settlement is it's going to. I think answer a lot of those questions, probably create a lot more, but I think the, essentially the NCAA is looking for some kind of salary cap saying, you know, you get your 22 million or whatever it is to, yeah. to spend on players, but we're going to somehow contain NIL money, at least that comes from collectives or. No one could stop front office sports from giving uh, Travion Henderson $10 million a year, right? Like that's not going to change, but through these collectives, which have really, kind of taken over NIL behind the scenes. It's it's you need someone saying, wait a second, like there has to be some control here. Well it remains to be seen if we dish out that contract. Right. But, you know, to, to be determined. Um on the the Shador Sanders, Travis Hunter thing, I mean we had Dion on the show a while back and I think it wasn't the first time he had said this, but he basically said, you know, we're if we don't like the team that drafts us, we're gonna pull an Eli Manning and hold out, force a trade, do something. Uh, how seriously do you take that? Very. Uh, I think one thing about Dion is he likes to talk, but he doesn't. I mean, I take him at his word. Things that he said, he has stuck to. Um, and and I've had the opportunity to interview him over the, the past you know 13 years that I've been doing this. And I've never thought him to be disingenuous or, or not truthful. You know, and, and so is he confident? Absolutely. But he, he pretty much backs up what he says. And so I think we should we should take it seriously now. The thing is, we can all look at, at NFL depth charts today and say, wow, the Raiders need a quarterback. The New York Giants need a quarterback. How do, you, how, how do we feel about those situations? A lot's going to look different in April. You know, the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, have two quarterbacks on one-year deals. Things could look very different. We don't know how the Dak Prescott situation is going to play out in Dallas. So uh, I think it would be, it's way too early in the process to say, especially with Shador Sanders, uh, to say, well, here are the, the handful of teams that you're going to want him to go to because general manager, head coach, and quarterback situation, especially for bad teams, is probably going to change pretty significantly in the next 10 months. So I think it would be too early to, to say that, right? However, you know, with Travis Hunter, I, I do think you can say, you know, you want him to go to a, a team where they're going to utilize his talents. He kind of has to decide if he wants to play offense or defense. And I think that from there, you know, you almost have a, a diagram of, do you want to play offense? Okay. You want to go somewhere where they will utilize you that way. If you want to play defense, here's your skill set as kind of a man coverage corner. Here are the defenses that would fit you well. I think the great thing about Dion is uh, he has knowledge of the game. He played in the NFL for a long time. He's been highly connected to the league since he retired as a broadcaster. So, you know, he has those connections to be able to, to reach out and I think get the right guidance for these two young players. I have not thought this through at all, but do you think any team would consider like a Shohei Otani situation with Travis Hunter or they, they let him do both? We haven't seen it in the NFL, but I hope so, it, especially until he kind of figures out which direction to go. We saw last year before he got hurt and him getting hurt had nothing to do with his usage. Right. Um, before he got hurt, we, we saw he was playing like 90 percent of the snaps. Uh, so his conditioning was incredible. We're talking in August and September when it's it's hot out, you know, early in the year and he was doing just fine. So. You know, I think it's it's natural to say he would primarily pick one side of the field and then dabble in the other. But, you know, we haven't seen it. Charles Woodson was a corner who played a, a tiny bit of receiver. Devin Hester was more of a return man. Champ Bailey and Chris Gamble stuck to defense. Miles Jack stuck to defense. We we really haven't seen any of these two-way guys ever attempted. So I, I kind of hope so, just to 
just make a, another fun story to, to kind of monitor. And yeah, looking at the NFL this coming season, we've got, so like Bo Nix is probably, you know, he's the starter for the Broncos. Caleb Williams, right. of course, is going to start for the Bears. Jaden Daniels for the Commanders. JJ McCarthy was going to be the, the Vikings guy until he got hurt. Um, do you think this is the new normal that we're going to have, you know, three, four-ish quarterbacks coming right out of the draft into a starting role? As much as Tom Brady doesn't like it, I do think this is the new norm, right? The ro- Like the day of the rookie sitting is is kind of gone. And it we could have a very long conversation about is that to the benefit or the detriment of the quarterback. And I I think it a lot matters on situation and the the individual player, but I do think it's the new norm. You know, it's, you want to capitalize on that rookie contract. You have four years where a rookie quarterback is pretty inexpensive. You want to capitalize on that. Also you have two to three years before you have to kind of make that decision on, is this our guy or not? You know, we're already talking about Bryce young is about to enter his second season. There's already conversations about, well, if he's not good this year and they have a top five pick, do they draft Shador Sanders or Carson Beck or Quinn Ewers to replace him? So the evaluation time has sped up on those guys. But also, you know, these quarterbacks now have been playing the position at a high level at a much longer period of time than, than when Tom was coming out of Michigan. They're playing in seven on seven from the minute they're in sixth or seventh grade. They also now have private quarterback coaches that work with them year round. So it's again, is that to the benefit or the detriment of the player? I don't think there's one straight answer on that, but it is absolutely the new norm that these guys, especially Bo Nix, who played 72 games in college, the most of any player ever, uh, you would expect him to be able to come in and play right away because he has you know six years of, of starting experience. Is it better for the quarterback to be sitting on the bench and, you know, I don't know, studying right. how things work? It's like with Trey Lance. You, you, Trey Lance had a year at South Dakota or North Dakota State, excuse me. And then, you know, he had one game during a COVID shortened season that, that he didn't play well in. He gets drafted by the Niners, doesn't play as a rookie. Second year, gets hurt. The guy's never played. He hasn't really played football since 2019. And so, like, how do you evaluate that? And I think on the other side of that, the one rookie quarterback that you didn't mention was Michael Penix, who the Falcons shocked us all and took in the first, uh, what, number pick number eight overall. And he's not played in the preseason. Uh, the plan is for him to sit behind Kirk Cousins for two to three years. He's already 24 years old. So that's almost the complete opposite effect of they're they're keeping this guy completely under wraps after that limited you know view that we saw in preseason week one. Since you bring it up, I, I asked Phil Sims about it. And he kind of defended the Falcons in this case, which I was a little surprised by. Um, did, did that whole thing make any sense to you? Still doesn't. It didn't then. Uh, I, like then when it happened, I was sitting in a, a hotel room in Detroit and just had that like looking at the TV. Like, it, is the, did the draft start or am I dreaming? Because the the week or so before the draft, I'll have these wild dreams that a player gets picked and I don't know who they are or something, you know. And it's like, is this one of those draft panic dreams that I'm having or is this real? And I I didn't get it then. I sat on it for a couple of days. I didn't get it. By the time we left Detroit, I still don't get it, especially the the way they're not using him. And I, you know, it does make you wonder, Kirk Cousins coming off the Achilles, if he's not as ready as you know, we've kind of been led to believe. And, and that, so they're trying to protect Penix because of that. Or I don't know, it's a bizarre situation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, getting back to this kind of like, you know, new normal of, you know, rookie quarterbacks come in and then they can play. Um, are we going to start to see, I mean, we, we talked you know, in episodes past about how like running the like veteran running back tends to be a little bit screwed unless they're elite because, you know, it's easy enough to find the next guy who is cheaper and, and, you know, doesn't have the mileage on his legs. Do you think we might start to see the same thing for, I don't know, the Daniel Joneses of the world who are like, they can hold a starting job somewhere in the league, but you know, the, you know, whatever, if it's Shador Sanders or whoever the next guy is, if the team has a high enough draft position, they can get a cheaper, possibly better version of him. And it's going to be harder for, uh, you know, those mid-level quarterbacks to find those jobs and get paid. Yeah. I think the good news for quarterbacks is there's, we have such a short attention span with them that there's always going to be opportunity. Like Sam Darnold is a starting quarterback with the Vikings now, but I will tell you like before the draft, there were arguments from people, very smart people that the Bears should keep Justin Fields and draft Caleb Williams because it wouldn't be that expensive to have them both and just kind of let them fight for the job. I think the, the side of the football side of that is 
that you're just messing with your locker room if you do that because the quarterback needs to be you know a figurehead and he needs to have a role on your roster and in your culture that would be very difficult that way but you know to your point I do think we we will see or should see teams taking more swings at the position just like San Francisco getting Brock Purdy has completely changed the dynamics of that Super Bowl window that seemed like it was probably gone or or at least closing and and they really reopened it because they've been able to keep veteran players that they wouldn't have been able to were they paying a Kirk Cousins at this point which was you know kind of the plan after Jimmy or excuse me before Jimmy Garoppolo so I I do think that smart teams will do that and and it will go back to how football was in the mid to late 90s where we had like the green bays of the world saying we'll draft a quarterback every year or every other year and the worst thing that's going to happen is we're going to you know they'll, they'll wash out the best thing that happens is we might have our future or we might be able to develop this player and then flip them for draft capital. So, you know, it's, there's, it's really not a bad scenario where you, if you want to invest day three picks in some of those quarterbacks that you might believe in their tools or their scheme fit, because you might hit on a Tom Brady or a Brock Purdy, or, you know, you might have a really good number two quarterback for a long time. On Brady's point of like, well, I sat on the bench for a year or two or whatever he did. I, he wasn't really considered like the next big thing, right? When no, when they drafted not at him, all. he was not at all. Pick one ninety nine. You're you're an afterthought, uh, very much so. I, I saw someone say once the Patriots kept four quarterbacks that year, and no, like no one's really done that since. You know, it was like Brady. Brady is such an anomaly and an outlier in so many ways. Um, I, re, I I I'm such a huge Tom Brady fan. I have the utmost respect for him. If he wants to speak on quarterback play, I'm going to learn a lot from him. But the economics of the game have changed so much that um, it's just it's hard for someone to sit and then become the guy. Um, everyone will point to Patrick Mahomes, another outlier situation where you had a, a playoff quarterback in Alex Smith. But uh, I, I think Michael Penix is going to be a fascinating case study in that of how that works out. Is it better to throw a guy out there and you know like C.J. Stroud last year and they turn a franchise around instantly, uh, or is it better to, to let a guy sit and wait? I wanted to get your thoughts on, so we've got a few holdouts right now, uh, you know, mm-hmm. CeeDee Lamb, Brandon Ayuk, um, uh, Hassan Reddick. And it sort of struck me that no quarterbacks that I can think of are doing this. You know, there's Dak Prescott, you could say, would would be a candidate for it. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, there's something about that position that just doesn't work for, for a holdout unless, you know, unless Dak was like, you know what, the Cowboys have nowhere else to turn. I'm going to get my big deal now. I mean, you could, I guess, make the case for that. But if the Cowboys just, you know, let them hold out, you know, something would have to really break sometime soon. They would, you know, they couldn't have a CD lamb situation with right. him. It feels like, you know, where they just they'd start him week one and hope for the best. I think so. You need so much lead time at that position where you need the chemistry, you know, because you're the constant and everything around you is often changing, whether it be scheme or even just new players on the offensive line, which in Dallas, they'll have, you know, two rookie starters, most likely on the offensive line. You're breaking in, you know, new players at wide receiver. So it's, I, I think it would be so hard for the quarterback to do that. And you're, you're right. As you were saying that, I was trying to think the last time we saw a true hold out at the quarterback position. I get, I mean, Deshaun Watson, but that situation was really unique. So it wasn't a true, really a true holdout. Um, it just, it doesn't happen anymore. And I, I think it does, it speaks to how important the quarterback position has become, but also like teams are not shy to just throw money at those guys. I feel like every week we have a new highest paid quarterback in NFL history. So it's, it's the one spot where, you know, with wide receivers, there's a big kind of conversation right now of, are they being overpaid now? You know, it, obviously Justin Jefferson's a unique player. CeeDee Lamb's fantastic. But there's that conversation of, like, how valuable is Brandon Ayuk? Is he, could you find a replacement for that in the first round, second round? Uh, because it seems like every year it's the best receiver class ever is every year now. And so I, I think that's part of the conversation is when is it smart to pay? And then when is it smart to to just look for a way to, you know, grab a guy in the the first or second round that can replace him all right well great to have you back on matt miller thanks so much for joining us on the show you bet thank you a large group of los angeles chargers players and personnel got stuck in a dallas elevator for two hours on friday night including star quarterback justin herbert who according to head coach jim harbaugh was a leader a rock kept everybody calm to the team's new coach the event wasn't just an unfortunate mishap it was a sign of his team's medal 
You get in those situations and it's a test of wills, Harbaugh said. I was proud of each of the guys and the two women that were on that elevator. That's a win. You feel good about yourself. You were challenged, it was a test of will, and you pull it down or pull it in. Harbaugh, who is not stuck in the elevator, also said that Herbert's hair was a little wet, but his shirt was completely dry. That was another thing that blew me away. On June 26th, the Red Sox were playing the Toronto Blue Jays when it started raining, and the game was suspended in the top of the second inning. The game will resume today as part of a doubleheader. However, in the interim, both teams have undergone some changes. Namely, the batter who was up for the Blue Jays, Danny Jansen, was traded, so when the game resumes, there will have to be a pinch hitter. As it happens, Jansen was traded to the Red Sox, and today he will be behind the plate for the Red Sox. That will make Jansen not just the first player to play for both teams in the same game, but the first player to become the catcher in an at-bat where he started as the hitter. It's no secret that pickleball has surged in popularity over the past five years or so. My next guest, Connor Pardo, saw the potential in the sport back in 2018 when he started the PPA Tour, which now runs an annual slate of tournaments. We spoke about the state of pickleball and how he is working to turn the huge number of pickleball players into spectators of the sport's highest level. I'm joined now by Connor Pardo, CEO and Commissioner of the PPA Tour. Welcome, Connor. Hey, thanks for having me on, Owen. Appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you. So you founded the PPA Tour in 2018. What kind of opportunity did you see in the sport back then when you know a lot of us hadn't necessarily heard of it? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I think a lot of people have a similar pickleball story of how they first, you know, for me, I started playing the game. Um, you know, growing up, I had a dad that coached me in all my sports that I played, whether it was basketball, baseball, football, tennis, whatever it was. But, um, you know, in 2018, found the sport of pickleball. And what was really cool about it is that we could play together, right? We could go out and we could play and Honestly, he was better than me, you know, being a college tennis player. And there's just something kind of special about that. And there's just something about the game. Once you play it, um, you just want to keep playing. You think, man, I could be pretty good at this. And just like a lot of people got addicted to the sport, uh, fell in love with it first and foremost, because it's just such a fun game to play. Um, found myself participating more, starting to enter into tournaments, saw that there were some really high level players and just thought, you know what, I think we, we could really professionalize this and do what other sports have done, do what the PGA has done to the done to golf or the ATP has done to tennis. We saw all the momentum, all the potential. Um, and there were some players that were already, you know, at a really high level. And, you know, the rest is kind of history. We've had a lot of fun doing it so far. Yeah. And sort of talk to me a little bit about what the PPA Tour does. Because as you're saying, you know, there are already tournaments, there are already, you know, high level players when you are coming in. So, you know, what are you adding to the pickle, competitive pickleball space? Yeah. So, you know, 2020 was our first season. So the tour got founded actually in 2019, 2020 was our first season. And so what we, what we did is there was a couple high level tournaments that were already being played. Um, at the time there was, I think three tournaments that offered prize money. And so we were able to go and work deals out with two of those tournaments and be able to bring them into the PPA tour and eventually acquire them. And then what we did is we supplemented it with our own tournaments that we started from the ground zero. So the first year, um, I believe we did eight total tournaments during the COVID year. And you can really think of what, what we're doing similar to what the PGA is to golf or the ATP is to tennis. You know, you look at professional pickleball right now, we have four grand slams. We have six events that we call cups and we have 15 events that are opens. So there's a 26 tournament season where the best players in the world are all complete competing to see who the best players really are. Yeah. Very cool. And just quickly on the starting in the COVID year, I mean, uh, I don't know if I did like eight events of any kind in, yeah. in, uh, after March of 2020. Um, were you able to, it sounds like you're kind of able to, you know, proceed almost almost sounds normal but um couldn't have been all that normal yeah no I, I think uh one thing that was a benefit to us is we were still a pretty small property so for us we were at the time you know being founded and started that year we ran our first event in february of 2020 which was pre-covid which i think was obviously super important because we ran that event and it was a huge a huge success and i think tasting that and seeing that I was like, man, we got to keep going. Like there's so much potential here. And if that didn't happen and if COVID happened the way it did, you know, I may, I might've not 
you know, continued to pursue what we did and trying to grow a tour. So like when you look yeah. back on the history and the timeline of things, the fact that that first event happened, you know, a month before the country shut down was pretty important. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, during COVID, what was nice is we, we were a smaller property. So, you know, we really focused on obviously trying to be safe, but at the same time, um, doing the best we could to continue to grow the business and trying to add tour stops and trying to be able to operate. Um, one, so the pro players had a livelihood. A lot of them had already quit jobs. They'd already committed to a tour. Um, and two, we just saw so much potential. We just didn't want to slow down. Yeah. And just, you know, hearing the schedule, you know, the four majors, six, was it six opens, about, about 26 total tournaments. Is that right? Yeah. 26. Um, um, it's, you know, it's, it sounds a lot like tennis or golf. Mm -hmm. Um, are those, did you just kind of take those as models or did you sort of look at it from scratch and say, actually, you know, the way those, these very established sports have been doing it is a, a good way to do it. How do you kind of find yourself in that schedule? Yeah. Like fortunate enough, like you, I've been able to surround myself with, you know, quite a few people that have either ran sports leagues or have been involved and been involved with the PGA or the WTA or the ATP. And so obviously we thought, Hey, that's a good framework for a sport like pickleball where we're talking about doubles, there's four people on a court. Um, so we, we obviously thought that made a whole lot of sense. Um, with that, I think what's a little bit unique about our property is that we actually own and operate all of our events. So you think of someone like the PGA or the ATP, you know, they're usually licensing out, um, selling tournaments, selling rights, making sure that things are up to their standards. But on the flip side, you know, we're kind of this hybrid mix between you know, a golf or tennis and also the UFC where we kind of own and operate everything. We're working directly with all the athletes. Our athletes have exclusive contracts with our tour. Um, so I, I would say we're really a blend kind of between those two, two properties. If you were going to say, who are you the most like, I would say somewhere between, you know, tennis and the PGA and, and UFC. Yeah. Interesting that UFC mixed in there. Uh, and yeah, are there other, you know, benefits or nuances to owning, you know, owning all your own events um, that, you know, maybe the tennis world has, you know, would be envious of. Yeah, I think so. Like you talk to these guys and you say, Hey, what are some things that went well and some things that didn't? And, you know, I think everyone wishes that they were able to hold on and own and operate more events. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously there's a lot, a lot that comes with that and a lot of control that we have, especially on these early stages, you know, we're only, in, you know, almost coming up on year five. So you're able to do a lot when you own and operate everything. Um, you know, in particular, trying to grow a sports brand and a sports property that, you know, we can actually bring it, bring in, you know, large sponsors or focus on what is this sport going to look like to try to be able to put it on TV. You know, the fact that we're running 25 events a year gives us the ability to really have that national reach when we go out and we try to sell sponsorships to brands. Mm hmm. In terms of the the player pool you have, I'm wondering, um, and you don't have to give me an exact number or anything, but around how many players, can, how many how many people in the world can make their living being a pickleball player? I know that people can be coaches and you know mm -hmm. maybe run courts or something, but in terms of just making it as a player, how big's that world? Yeah, and this is a story we're trying to tell because we're we're really proud of what we've been able to do um, as far as helping pro players become actual pro athletes. So if you take a look at um, where we're at, we have just over 145 pro players, um, equal between male and female. Uh, the top players in the world are making $2 million a year. Um, and out of our top 100 players, the average salary is $300,000 a player, um, which is equally split between men and women. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of people now doing this full time and that's not counting, you know, their sponsorships, their endorsements, their personal paddle deals or clothing deals. You know, you take a look at like a Ben Johns or Annalee Waters, you know, they're making $2 million a year from us. I'd expect their total earnings this year being somewhere around the $5 million range for playing professional pickleball. Yeah, not bad. Um, what did you make of Novak Djokovic's comments that pickleball and padel are threats to tennis? And then, of course, you know, agreeing to play a high-profile pickleball match. <laughs> but I'm wondering, um, uh, yeah, well, how you responded to that? Yeah, like I don't, I don't know if it's really a threat necessarily to tennis. I'm one of the big believers that like one plus one equals three. I think the more we can be working together, there's a lot of people that play tennis that also play pickleball. There's a lot of people that play pickleball that also play tennis. Um, I did think it was funny, like one of our 
um, high level athletes. Her name's Callie Smith. She's a head sponsored athlete. It was funny to, to see that article come out. And then like two or three weeks later, she's in New York city playing, you know, tennis with the whole head crew. Um, but yeah, look, I, I think, um, I think pickleball actually should be a good thing for tennis. It's something that keeps people out there. It keeps people active. I think it's a really good transition sport to someone that might not want to be playing tennis as much. Um, the only validity that I could see to that is, you know, I think people are now looking at pickleball a little bit more seriously. I mean, look, you're a pro league that's going to be paying out $31 million to pro players this year. Like I could actually make a living and we're starting to see kids start at a younger age instead of just people transitioning um, from tennis or other sports to pickleball. You know, we had a, a tournament this summer where we had over 150 juniors come out and participate in San Clemente. And even just this weekend, you know, we have the Utah Open um, going on right now and we had 77 juniors participate. So that's, those numbers are just huge compared to where it was, you know, before. So, I, I mean, it's interesting to see that there's going to be a lot of people coming into the sport where they start as pickleball as a first sport, which we're pretty excited to see, you know, what kind of players that makes. Yeah. And another thing that makes pickleball interesting to me is it's a sport that, at least right now, most people are getting introduced to as a player, as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, maybe seeing it on TV. I'm, I am starting to see it on TV a little bit more, mm -hmm. um, but... Um, but yeah, it's still something I, I will see just like walking past a park more often than I see, you know, on a screen. Um, how do you kind of build that participatory audience into one that could be interested in you know, following the tour? Yeah, I mean, and that's, that's a great question. Oh, and that's something that we're thinking about every day. So for us, like we understand that pickleball, it's growing. There's over 40 million people playing pickleball now. And so, you know, a lot of people are like, Hey, how are you going to, you know, get people to tune into the broadcast or how are you going to get more people to want to watch it? Our first step is like, we're not really chasing the NFL viewer. What we're trying to do is have those 40 million people that play every day. How can we make them care who Tyson McGuffin is or who Anna Bright is or who Ben Johns or Annalie Waters is. And so, um, you know, some of the things that we're trying to do is really trying to get the tour um, enriched in local pickleball communities, make sure that we're running events in places that have high, um, people playing pickleball, like high participants that are participating in the sport. Um, one thing that we do, I think that's unique compared to other leagues is when we go and we run an event, like, again, I'll give this weekend for an example. We have the 200 best players in the world here participating, you know, over a four day period, but we're also running an amateur tournament that coincides with this event where we have 1,056 players that are coming to participate. So you walk in, we're playing at a convention center and we've got, 36 courts being played on. So you have eight courts that have grandstands built out that are being broadcast that the best players in the world are playing that you can buy a ticket to come and watch. But then you also have all the additional courts where whether you're a beginner, a beginning player, an intermediate player, an advanced player, no matter your age, whether you're a junior, whether you're, you know, 35 years old or even 60, you can come and participate against your own age level, your own skill level. Then you can get a beer, enjoy the environment, watch Tyson McGuffin. And it's just something unique we're doing. And I think that's really going to help um, as we continue to grow the sport because you can come and play and you can watch the world's best. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how this all progresses as, as the years go on. And Connor Pardo, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. The U.S. Open begins today in Queens. Here's some things to know to get prepped. There's a record-breaking $75 million in prize money, and for the first time, the first-round prize money will reach six figures. The winner will take home $3.6 million, and the runner-up will get $1.8 million. The cheapest grounds pass for opening day is $154, and the cheapest grounds pass for the final day is $315. Overall hospitality sales, which also encompass private suites, courtside seats, and other lounges, are up 27% this year from last year. Yannick Sinner's doping scandal continues to be a big topic leading into the tournament. The top-seeded Sinner says he hasn't done anything wrong, while second-seeded Novak Djokovic said that there is a lack of standardized and clear protocols and that he understands the sentiments of a lot of players that are questioning whether they are treated the same. Deion Sanders dropped some notable statistics at the start of his press conference on Saturday, showing how things have changed in the years since he's taken over as head coach of Colorado. For Sanders, the university has seen a 20% increase in total applications, up to 67,000 total. That includes a 29% increase in applications from people of color and a 50% boost from African-American men. Prime also had some telling comments about his own fiercely competitive nature, saying, Everything I do is competitive, even endorsements. We just walk two miles and I had to win. 
In the Bears Olympics, the world learned the name of champion pole vaulter Mondo Duplantis. On Sunday, he broke his world record once again, elevating 6.26 meters. Here he goes to try and better his own world record by one centimeter. Mondo Duplantis at 6.26. Oh, and he does it! Another world record! That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, we'd really appreciate a rating or review on your podcast app or a like and subscribe on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.